And just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Bill Winston. I am a data, or I'm sorry, a GIS analyst in data services, uh, work for the Ola Library. And I know several of you, and I'm glad to see you here. And I hope that today will give us a chance to share um, information about uh, a platform that is useful and I think can help your teaching uh, and help your students actually express themselves and also incorporate uh, spatial mapping and spatial concepts uh, into work that they might be doing into your classes. So I'm going to start a um, slide deck here. Give me just a second. And I'm going to share my screen. That might also be important. OK, so you guys should be seeing a slide teaching with our so ArcGIS Online, or better known as AGOL to those of us in the know, is a platform that is browser-based, and it basically provides tools for mapping, storytelling, and data collection. And we're going to go through several examples of those today, and you're also going to meet some faculty members who have used this package in uh, their classes uh, over the course of several semesters. Uh, some of them have a little bit more experience than others, but um, you'll get a, a range of applications that this, uh, that this tool can be used for. So uh, first I'd like to start out and just give you a little bit of information about data services. Uh, the data services team is comprised of Jennifer Moore, who is our head. Doris Scott is, uh, or Dr. Doris Scott, I should say, is our social science data curator and GIS librarian. Molly Webb is our GIS programmer. She's joined us today. And I am Bill Winston. I'm a GIS analyst. So data services is actually a, um, an arm of the university libraries. Our offices are located in Olin Library on level A. And we provide services for managing, analyzing, visualizing, sharing, and preserving data. And uh, GIS is one of the things that we provide uh, a lot of support for. Uh, but the, the main thing we argue is that we take uh, data that might be messy and disorganized like this and, and turn it into something that uh, is a little bit more useful and um, uh, basically able to be preserved and, and used for research as opposed to just uh, some messy bit of information. And uh, I'll be leading our session today and then uh, introducing the faculty testimonials. Hey, everyone. Good to see you this afternoon. My name is Molly Webb. As Bill mentioned before, I am on the data services team at the University Library. And um, I would say that my, ex my experience with AGOL is pretty extensive. Um, so if you uh, have any questions about it and um, Bill is unavailable. I hope that you'll uh, reach out to me or really any of us on the data services team. Uh, we're big proponents of AGOL, so we'd be happy to help. Thanks for coming. I'll just give you a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. First of all, we're going to define what ArcGIS Online actually is and how it might be used for test or for teaching. Then I'll go through or I will introduce four faculty testimonials. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Louie, Dr. Andrea Murray, Dr. Sarah Batesel, and then Dr. Corinna Tritel uh, is not here, but I will be speaking about a project that I worked with her on. Uh, then we'll briefly talk a little bit about the kinds of support that are available for ArcGIS online at Washington University. We'll take a brief break, uh, and then we'll come back, and depending on how much time is available, I'm going to work through a, a quick demo of some of the things that we can do in ArcGIS online. And this is really not designed to be a, um, a training session, more so it's, it's just going to be a demonstration of some of the things that you can do and just give you a sense for how uh, quickly something like this, can, uh, like a story map can come together. Then we'll um, talk about some of the other support resources that we have uh, as far as training uh, and getting started with ArcGIS Online. And we'll end with a Q&A session that will hopefully give you a chance to address any questions that come up during the course of the session. 
So what, in, what exactly is ArcGIS Online? ArcGIS Online is a product of uh, ESRI. This is a company that makes GIS software. Uh, and they make several versions of GIS. Uh, most of them are desktop related. But ArcGIS Online is actually a browser-based GIS. And the advantage here is there is no requirement to install software. And one of the other advantages that I'll talk a little bit more about as we go along is access to um, or easy access to spatial information. Uh, and there are a lot of online data resources that are shared by authoritative sources, along with uh, a lot of other GIS data that's actually posted up by ArcGIS Online users. And so it, it makes for a very easy methodology to interact with spatial information and then share the results of that in an online fashion. So you can build basically a, an online map that allows users access to your information and then allows them to interact with them on their own terms. The platform is accessed through our Wustel ArcGIS online organization, uh, and the login there is, is managed through the Wustel key. So you don't have to set up a new account. Uh, you'll be able to use your Wustel key. And, and of course, this is available to all the students as well. And I'll talk more in the demo about how the students would actually get access to the platform. Now, the platform includes some many or some ready-made applications and solutions. And story mapping is one of those things that is, uh, I guess I would call it somewhat ready-made in that it's a, it's a platform on, onto which you can pour your content. Uh, that content can be maps, it can be images, and it can be text. Uh, and we'll see several examples of how that might be used in a teaching situation uh, during the course of the session today. Now, there are lots of online resources. Uh, those include videos uh, training you on how to use the platform, examples of how the platform has been used to tell stories or share information and uh, access to those uh, will help you understand what is possible with this very with this uh, uh, with this web based platform. So first of all, ArcGIS Online is an online GIS. It's a geographic information system that allows you to create maps. And then those maps can be incorporated into story maps and also into web apps and mobile apps that can be uh, visualized and interacted with on a mobile phone. We're also able to create dashboards and to do data collection via smartphones. So there's a lot of different um, tools that are provided with the platform, and we'll be talking about uh, several of those today. One of the tools that you might already be familiar with is this online mapping option. If you've ever visited the WashU campus map, you are viewing and interacting with an online uh, map that allows us to share information about the university. Uh, where are the buildings? Uh, where, are, where are the parking lots? How do I get from here to the, from one building to another on the campus? Uh, in fact, in the image that you're seeing here, this is just a screenshot of the live map that's available through the browser. Uh, but the, the circular icons that you see are actually dynamic representations of the, um, of the circulating shuttle buses in the system. And those, uh, if we were looking at the live version, would be moving uh, ever so slowly around the campus, showing us the exact location of those buses. Uh, this is a, an interesting example of using data that's fed by uh, devices that are on those buses basically publishing the, the locational information about the bus uh, in real time. And then that, that service is consumed and published through our map in order to share that information with uh, folks that might be waiting for the bus and wondering where the heck it is. So online mapping is one of the basic uh, applications of ArcGIS Online. And with those online maps, we can create interesting uh, mashups uh, that combine text, images, and maps uh, to produce what's called a story map. And a story map at its most basic could be considered a web page. Uh, and it's a web page that's that's optimized for sharing spatial information, but it also allows users to get creative and use images and text 
to create a dynamic web page that uh, communicates uh, a specific story. And I've got several examples in this slide deck. Uh, the first is a sustainability tour. This was uh, built by the sustainability program. They wanted to highlight some of the sustainable aspects of our campus. And so they took uh, a series of stops and on the map, you can see all these circular dots. They represent different stops in the story map. And, and as a user scrolls through this page, and we'll look at some live versions of story maps later, uh, as the user scrolls through the page, they basically visit each one of these locations in turn, and they get information about what's there. So this is a really good way to share uh, spatial information and to guide your users through uh, a, basically a guided tour of, in this case, uh, sustainability features on campus. Uh, but there are other examples showing the art installations on campus. Uh, and of course, there are many applications uh, or examples of this uh, throughout the throughout the web. The library also uses uh, story maps to share information. Uh, and this is a story map about exploring the mapping of LGBTQ St. Louis. Uh, it's a digital exploration of the lesbian, bay, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer communities over time in the St. Louis region. Uh, and this was a collaborative effort of several folks here at the library, along with some others, uh, to share this information and to build a lasting uh, resource that can be used uh, into the future. Uh, another example here is this monumental anti-racism page. This is uh, was created and is curated by Jeff, Dr. Jeff Ward. Uh, it's a survey of anti-racist memory work that he's been working on for several years now. And, and it includes uh, information about uh, racism and race, racially related monuments uh, across the United States. And it includes a collaborative map that has been built up over time, showing a lot of these information or a lot of these locations and sharing information about what's been going on at that particular place. So we've got online maps, we've got story maps, and then we also have web apps and dashboards. Uh, and these are basically um, additional types of tools that you can use in ArcGIS Online. There's a, a, a brief um, summary of some of the tools over here on the left hand side. This is just part of a menu of tools that I'll be showing you later uh, that indicates some of the various things that we can do just outside or out of the uh, basically a, a a uh, template that's provided with ArcGIS Online. This one is actually an example of something called Quick Capture. And I designed a little iPhone app that allows me to collect river habitat information. I actually did this for, uh, for more personal reasons than anything else. I, I, I tend to spend a lot of time doing some canoeing in the in the state. And I wanted to be able to map some of the habitat that I encounter uh, as I'm canoeing down the stream. So I built this little app that allows me to collect line features that are correspond to the different types of habitat that I might encounter on a stream. And then I actually tested it out uh, while I was driving down the highway one day. Uh, and you just click on the button and it records uh, the different type of um, habitat as you go along until you actually change it to something else. And so it's a very easy way to build and capture spatial information uh, that really doesn't require a lot of, uh, a lot of work to set up. Uh, and so that's one example of the, 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 the template type functions that are available. Another application is one that you might be familiar with from all of our time dealing with COVID. And this is the COVID-19 dashboard uh, from John Hopkins University. This is basically an ArcGIS online dashboard that links the spatial data that they've been collecting over time on the COVID outbreak and shares it through an interactive map. Now, I'm not showing the live version here, but if you've had any uh, occasion to visit this map, you're able to click and zoom uh, to focus in on any particular area in the map. In, in fact, you could zoom into Missouri, you could look at uh, a, a a, uh, a more detailed representation of what's going on in the state uh, at the county level even. And so this is a, an example of 
uh, an entity that is sharing a digital database that they've been collecting and uh, building up over time ever since the uh, start of the pandemic. And it basically allows you to give users access to that information uh, while, uh, you know, basically curating the way that it looks uh, on the map. And you can include all of these other widgets that you see, the graphs and the table here uh, presenting these numbers. These are widgets that can be included in the dashboard to round out the information that you're sharing with those users. So that's a brief overview of some of the uh, basic applications that we can do with ArcGIS Online. And now I want to move into the testimonial section of the, uh, uh, of the, the seminar today. We're going to have testimonials from Dr. Suzanne Louie. Um, she is from Environmental Studies. Dr. Andrea Murray from Anthropology. Dr. Sarah Batesel is also from Anthropology. And then I'll, uh, I'll uh, come back in and talk about group projects for a history class uh, after that. So I'm going to end my show here for a second. And uh, let me turn that turn it over to Suzanne Louie briefly. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, as Bill said, I'm a lecturer in environmental studies, and I teach Introduction to Environmental Humanities. Um, the use of story maps in my class has really enhanced student learning, I'd say, in two substantial ways. First, uh, it enriches and clarifies student understanding of history and sharpens their readings of text. So one of the texts I use is Black Elk Speaks. Um, it's the story of a Sioux medicine man, a healer, a spiritual leader, who was born in 1863 in what is now Wyoming, and he died in 1950. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about him to help you understand why story mapping was so important for the students. Black Elk's childhood, spanned the American colonization, theft, and fragmentation of the Sioux landscape. And Bill, you can move on to the background page, consisting of parts, what, uh, parts of what we now know as Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, bits of Montana, and Colorado. Through the book, Black Elk's development into adulthood is fully described, with the text culminating in his presence at the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. Now, as Black Elk moves from childhood into his teens, he often describes in his text the constant movement he experienced. His clan fled often, you know, simply trying to stay away from American military incursions, trying to find respite in their natural landscape. Over years of teaching this text, um, I explained this to the students, this, to look for this notion of fleeing. But I was concerned that through the lens of modern transportation, it was hard for them to realize the physical and mental demands that Black Elk was describing. And therefore, it was hard for them to better realize the injustice and trauma of the Sioux community. So having described my concern to Bill one day in casual conversation about our week, I said, oh, I wish I could just map it or something. And he said, well, we can, but better yet, your students can. And we took off from there into a collaboration focusing on the use of story mapping to better internalize and understand the text and um, enabling those students with the interest to make their own maps. Now, as with many students, this was Emily's first time making a story map and also her first time making her own maps. But using this platform increased her awareness and ability to represent the geographical space and movement and therefore the cultural dilemma endured by the Sioux Nation. So first he maps the treaty breaking intrusion of the Bozeman Trail through Sioux hunting grounds. She then identified um, and mapped the new military forts which were being built along that same, pardon me, along that same trail. <clears throat> She then illustrates the increasingly truncated span of natural ecosystems accessible to the Sioux. Um, what she's showing here, and she describes a little bit later, is they can live in the blue, but only hunt in the, in, in the yellow. Um, whereas they used to be able to roam, and by treaty they could roam um, throughout this whole area. But now they're only kind of allowed to, to legally 
in the US sense be in that blue area. He maps Custer's expedition into the heart of the Sioux sacred Black Hills and the trauma of flight by the Native Americans. And this, what you're seeing here in this map is that blue line that goes through the center, enters right into the, the heart of the Black Hills, um, which really was the, the most sacred area for the Sioux. Well, when Custer arrived there, Black Elk's clan was camped in the Black Hills. They were hunting, they were finding rest and food in this rich landscape where the US was not allowed by treaty to enter. Well, Black Elk's clan suddenly became aware of military presence close by. And here is where um, Emily uses to great effect the story map platform to magnify the experience being indicated by the narrative text. Black Elk's family decides to flee from the Black Hills due to the encroaching soldiers back to the Red Cloud Agency. Black Elk describes his journey. It was nearly sundown when we started and we fled all that night on the back trail towards Spring Creek. Then down that creek to the South Fork of the Good River. I rode most of the night on a pony drag because I got too sleepy to stay on a horse. We camped at Good River in the morning but we stayed only long enough to eat. Then we fled again upstream all day long until we reached the mouth of the Horse Creek. We hurried on in the night through the smoky Earth River, the White River, and when we got there, I woke up and it was daybreak. We camped a while to eat and then went up to the smoky Earth, two camps, to Robinson, for we were afraid of the soldiers up there. Black Elk's clan arrived at Fort Robinson, which was located at the second Red Cloud Agency, which had been established in South Dakota. So she's used, she's identified the geographical locations that he talked about in the text. And typically you wanna note, he uses names different from those that we use today. Um, and so she hunts down what those names are and what they, you know, what they uh, relate to. And then she captures through the mapping, the geographical distance through which we better understand the fear and fatigue of a community being invaded. Finally, in the Wild West show, um, by 1886, and we're just hopping through this, there are other sections to this story map, but um, Black Elk felt as though there were little hope for his people. He signed a contract to perform with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show because he figures that maybe he needs to go out and see more of white culture and then he'll understand these people. So again, Emily uses the mapping and the story map platform to great effect by taking us through his travels into the white world. And you can just scroll on through Bill. He actually, he goes to New York City, if you can imagine. Um, he hasn't been outside of his own geographical location before in the, in near the Black Hills. He goes to Europe, he goes to England, he goes to Spain and Italy. Um, he travels all over. And she completes this chapter by showing what he returned to. And right there, Bill, if you can hold it. He's returned to the further reduction of Sioux freedom as they were put into what they always feared and they always called little islands. They always said they're going to, they're trying to put us on little islands. Um, and there will be even a further reduction in that, in that area that she talks about further along. So again, the use of story mapping really enriched and clarified the student's understanding of history and sharpened her reading of the text as it does for many of the students in my environmental humanities class. So having gotten that one under my belt, um, I was like, I thought we should just keep doing it. And with Bill's encouragement, we started applying story mapping to a different part of the course, which was the unit on the Dust Bowl. And this takes me to the second point I wanna make about the use of story mapping. It allows students to better integrate their own interests and multiple disciplinary lenses into these historic, these and of these historic environmental, um, sorry, and into these historic eras and environmental texts. So this is If It Rains by Ali Sarusi. And again, I'll share a little background about the, the era before I before I share the student's work for the third. The Dust Bowl era technically occurred from 1930 to 1940. It's an extremely complicated environmental event. It demands an understanding of historic weather patterns, the rise of new agricultural technology, economics and the depression, 
and last but not least, human hubris in terms of nature and the sense of white superiority, which enabled the American attempt <clears throat> to farm the Southern High Plains region, uh, a landscape completely unsuited to such an endeavor. So in the course, we use a text called The Worst Hard Time by Timothy Egan. Now for this uh, particular story map, I'm less concerned about the, a super close reading of the text and more concerned about integrating those parts of the environmental disaster. When Allie thought about her project, she wrote this. I'd like to focus on the issue of water and rain in the plains and how it affected the people living there. I'm interested in the scientific aspects of the Dust Bowl, such as the Ogallala Aquifer. I'm also interested in the causes of drought and precipitation fluctuations in general. I plan on including information about farming techniques pre and post the Dust Bowl era that contributed to the issues with the dryness of the soil. I want to represent the hopeful nature of settlers living through the drought. So what was great here is that she wanted to integrate science with human hope which ultimately is a more realistic view of the period. And this story mapping platform really allowed her to do that well. So on, on, in the section on the Ogallala Aquifer, Allie illustrates for us how there was an enormous amount of water beneath the surface and explains to us how it was formed. I always love it when students do this and they, they're talking about the dust bowl of the 20s, of the 30s and uh, 40s, and um, they start you know, millions of years back. Uh, which she did, it was great. So she illustrates um, why there was an enormous amount of water um, and how it was formed. And then in rainfall on the Southern High Plains, she explains before settlers knew of the Ogallala's surplus of fresh water below ground, they relied on water above, that is precipitation. She used the science she loves to convey the predicament into which farmers were being led roughly 20 inches of rain were needed to ensure successful crops. The area west of the 100th meridian only received about an average of 16, and that's where the Dust Bowl occurred. With Bill's help, she integrated Dust Bowl precipitation maps. In farming practices and imbalances in the ecological system, she illustrated how the plants of the Southern Plains were suited to the ecosystem how they kept healthy with their long roots and kept the soil in the ground through fluctuations of rainfall. But she shows us how crops were not capable of doing this, leaving, leaving us with um, a land that's just purely, literally dust. Then the causes of the drought, um, Bill, you can just scroll this into this, but she uses, she loves just giving us different examples of the science of drought. And then she gets into hope for rain. And this is where she relies more on textual evidence and first person testimonies. Um, she has Lawrence um, Zvobita. Uh, Every day I scanned the sky looking for signs of the rain that would save my wheat from ruin. One after another, neighbors saw their crops reach a condition beyond hope of salvage. Um, he is a Kansas wheat farmer who like many people of the Dust Bowl, continuously look to the sky for the next rainfall. Then she goes down to Carolyn Henderson and that's beneath this nice little blue map that she's got. Well, Carolyn Henderson sent letters detailing her experiences of the Dust Bowl and these are Allie's words. In these letters, she emphasizes the past pros um, prosperity of the plains. There are also practical considerations that serve to hold us here for the present, writes Carolyn. Our soil is excellent. We need only a little rain less than in most places to make it productive. No one who remembers the wheat crops of 1926, 29, or 31 can possibly regard this as a permanently submarginal land. The newer methods of farming suggest possibilities of better control of moisture in the future. We've spent so much trying to keep our land from blowing away that it looks foolish to walk off and leave it when somewhat more favorable conditions seem now to cast their shadows before us. So as, as Henderson's letter shows, there was this constant hope that conditions um, could change. And that hope was the factor that kept farmers and their families on the plains, despite the fact that they looked like they were living um, in just simply a destroyed landscape. 
So, and she did this very nice thing that Bill just showed you where she's actually got a small photo of Caroline where she had her homestead. And then she has a um, photo of Lawrence where he lived, the Kansas City wheat farmer. So story mapping allows students, I think, to better integrate their own interests and interdisciplinary lenses into these historic eras and texts. And finally, I'd like to call your attention to how the story mapping platform includes a section for credit. Um, and it allows the students to hold themselves accountable to what they're using and, um, and, it, and, and it helps us help them put it in uh, a very understandable and clear format. Um, if I have a little advice, I'd say have a knowledgeable colleague, <laughs> have a Bill Winston around. Um, collaborating with him has really brought a new dimension to this course. It's making the study of environmental humanities all the more meaningful, I think, to the students. And um, his colleagues and he are able to advise the students throughout the semester if they have questions in their story mapping. Um, and an ongoing challenge, I would say, is just coming up with a system to grade them. We, we kind of go back and forth with that. Bill and I are still working on that. And that's it. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much, Suzanne. And just one point to make for everyone, the, the pages that I'm going through are just basically a scrollable web page. The images and text are embedded in the page, but in many cases, the maps are dynamic in that you can, as a user, click on the map and pull up more information, just like I did when I moused over those two in those two images or locations for the people that that uh, were being discussed. Uh, it it triggers a pop-up that allows the students to include either uh, it, image information or other text to give some, some more context to the features that are being displayed there. Okay, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Murray, and she's going to talk about her anthropology classes and how she's used, um, how she's used ArcGIS Online in those classes. Andrea? Hi, everybody. Um, firstly, Suzanne, I want to take your class. Just had to say that. Looks like fantastic work happening over in environmental humanities. Um, and as, as Bill mentioned, I am a lecturer in anthropology, global health, and environment. So um, I'm often, often in my classes emphasizing changes in the landscape, and that's broadly defined. But that was, I think, what first got me onto the idea of working with story maps. Um, there's also just, I think, um, in sort of uh, everyday life as, as readers, um, a few phenomena that I've noticed. Um, one might be the, the, uh, the TLDR, too long didn't read phenomenon, which I'm hoping to combat with story mapping. Uh, I think that students, um, while well, they come to college to learn how to read lengthy, dense texts and how to write lengthy, sometimes dense essays, we're in this kind of unusually interactive moment where, um, for example, if you think about the way the New York Times has been mapping forest fires in the West Coast um, and the way that increasingly multimedia are, are um, featuring in, in essays and articles and in, in journalistic work, it seems to me that students come to WashU hungry for greater stimulus, for better or for worse. And so this is one way in my classes that I look to um, encourage them to both to both engage with the readings that we're doing that is to say i might assign a more traditional essay and then ask them if you were to map this argument how might you do it what what plots would you point what part of the world would we be looking at um, so it can be a little more engaging for them than composing a, a traditional essay but i also think that mapping has the capacity to be less sensational to great effect than say um, television um, images and sort of the, the emotionally kind of provocative um, nature often of film content. So in a sense, um, they can take a more uh, discerning and critical stance on an issue that can be very, um, I think in some ways inflamed by uh, other kinds of multimedia. Um, so this is one, these are just a few of the reasons that I like um, ArcGIS Online. Um, as far as what I have since doing, we'll go through a couple of examples in just a minute. I, I, I call it um, cartographic competence. That's what we're working on achieving. That is to say, I encourage them to look at um, a, a variety of maps. They might be um, more static maps. They might be maps from an archive, um, maps that are you know, 
uh, representing the world as it used to be or as we used to think it used to be, um, and then encouraging them to problematize what they find um, by digging into some of the uh, data tables that are made available through, um, through AGOL. And uh, usually my students are able to do really well with the project, just drawing on data that's readily available, though I know Bill has worked with a couple of my students over the years um, who wanted to import their own CSV tables to come up with uh, uh, a data set that might not be um, already provided. Um, and uh, what I like to have them do is by, by incorporating in the shore maps at least one, um, one map that they're borrowing and then one map that they're working to generate through this platform I get them, I, my hope anyway, is that they'll start to think about what it means to represent or to, to make an argument about a, a place or a, a, a problem um, or a, a cultural group, a cultural phenomenon, this kind of thing. So in effect, I'm trying to help them learn how to build a more compelling argument through the use of these visual aids. The idea being that they could they could write a perfectly strong essay that would stand on its own without some of these maps, but that they can actually enhance um, just as if they were drawing on, um, excerpting from a text, you know, quoting from a longer text in a more traditional essay, the map can kind of be the evidence of the argument that they want um, to write out. Um, so there's an, a mixture of the kind of show and the tell. Um, but as with a traditional essay, I emphasize them to them that they can't just plop a block quote in and say, this is, you know, this is it, this is my argument. They have to tell the, the reader or the, the, um, the user what to notice um, and what to make of, of what they're presenting. Um, uh, so yeah, so I said a little bit about the politics of mapping and how this is an opportunity for them to think through it, just to become aware that maps, just like other kinds of texts are, are um, always taking some kind of a position, right? Thinking through the meaning of objectivity when it comes to visual a representation of a place. Um, my goals are, of course, for them to gain a basic facility with ArcGIS, which I know some of my students have told me after the fact it's come in handy in job interviews, has come in handy when they're applying for an internship, say in public health and saying, I have, I have this skill and I would like to work on uh, you know, a, a project I could assist your organization in this way. Um, so I like to think it's, it's, it's not, of course, just for anthropology by any means, but it actually has um, uh, post-graduation applications, so-called real world. Um, and somebody had asked a question, I think, about the utility of um, story mapping for uh, public health concerns in St. Louis. That's been a very a popular application of this platform for me in, in a course that I teach on St. Louis. Um, where there's readily available data mapping in, um, income inequality, uh, income inequality, uh, food deserts um, overlaid with educational attainment, looking at just the neighborhoods surrounding WashU. So it can be very local, of course, it can be um, looking at very distant uh, places as well. Um, so I guess we can look at a couple of the examples, Bill, and then I'll offer a little bit of my advice. Okay. Um, here we go. Let me get this one shared. So these three are all from a course that I teach on tourism and sustainability. Um, and this one, so this student is a great title, Meet Me at the Intersection of Over-Tourism, Authenticity, and Economics. And this is a student who actually um, did great work here. And I encourage all of my students to enter a competition sponsored by AGOL, um, and he was a finalist for the student uh, competition this past fall. I think the prize was $1,000 or something like that. So if you need some other incentive, it can be very appealing to students to think, well, I might actually win something, of course. Um, but this also this idea that there's an opportunity to, to, um, to showcase their work be beyond, to give it a life beyond just one semester. Just a side, a side note about that. Um, and if we uh, scroll down a little, I think to the, the first, I think maybe it's the, the student is looking at, at essentially the Caribbean region and trying to understand um, how distinct it is in terms of the economic makeup of the region, looking at a few different countries. And he's got these um, images, which of course are the, the postcard images of these places on the left, which you can uh, click on and it will take you to um, the particular place that he's looking at. And this is one of the examples where you can use the, um, the uh, Zoom feature, yeah. So you get the idea of 
the sort of paradisical representation of the place. Um, and he gives basic, basic information, uh, population, um, and of course, uh, right, the thing that he's most interested in here is um, percentage of total, total jobs devoted to travel and tourism. And he's focusing here on countries where that percentage is more than 50 um, as sort of a, a, a marker of what makes some of these countries very, very distinct um, in terms of how the population works and lives in relation to, uh, to tourism and tourists. Um, and if you scroll down a little more, Bill, I think the, well, you can see in some, this is an example of where, um, you know, some borrowed data can be incorporated. It's of course not just maps. So we've got the, the photographs, we've got um, a couple of graphs and charts, um, some on the env environmental impact of tourism. And then this map, this uh, uh, gross domestic product, um, trying to read it here, in any event, if we, if we zoom in a little on some of these colorful dots, what he's doing here is first of all, trying to sort of notice and then I think emphasize how the, um, the per capita income of a lot of these tourism dependent places is, um, many of you wouldn't be surprised to know, but a lot lower than other parts of the world. Meanwhile, um, the percent of uh, employment that is reliant on tourism is represented by these um, colorful dots. And so for me, um, this is one of these um, opportunities for an aha moment for a student who maybe hasn't really thought about a particular part of, part of the world outside of um, often, uh, often for my students that, you know, in their role as a tourist going to a place and, and maybe um, spending money and not really thinking about exactly uh, what their role is in participating in the global economy. And so this is, um, this I thought was a very impressive rendering of that. And even though he's focused on the Caribbean, you can um, toggle around within the map and he's actually got data from other parts of the world. And of course, the larger the green dot represents a larger um, uh, per capita income. So this I think was some really nice work. And it's one of these, uh, I, I sometimes liken this part of the mapping project to a choose your own adventure for on the part of the user. So the student can drive an argument and can tell you what to notice. And that's one of my pieces of advice, right? Is again, to remind the students that they have to be explicit when there is so much data available and what thread they want you to follow. But it also can be really fun as a, as a reader when I'm, when I'm grading these things, just to see, oh, well, when I poke around, what else do I notice? So it can be interactive. I can have a conversation with students during office hours and so forth about um, what they found and then areas for additional exploration. So midway through the semester, we'll, we'll do a preliminary map that will be smaller, uh, maybe less ambitious, and then they have the option for their final project of coming back and expanding that map and asking a different set of questions that builds on the, the data that they've um, examined initially. Um, and this may be, I want to say, one of the borrowed maps. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. There was something, just I guess while I'm thinking of it, I'll echo Suzanne about the, the problem of citation as one of the things that um, the best story maps are, of course, the ones that explain clearly, this is the work that I did, and here are the, here are the sources I draw on it, and this is the work that someone else did that I'm in conversation with. Um, I think students just have a, a, they're less clear on how to cite um, visual forms of information. Um, they're much more practice, of course, with citing and, and more traditional essays. And so just reminding them, even just demonstrating to them that in fact, this is also something that needs attribution um, can be helpful. And we can go through a, a, just a couple, um, couple more. This is a really fun one, also from my tourism class. I had a student who was looking, looking at the history of gambling on Macau but also um, thinking about um, typical structures of um, gaming casinos areas when landscapes are developed for this kind of tourism. Um, and so of course we have the splashy images that make us all maybe wanna go, maybe not if you're <laughs> not into the casino scene, but it's, but it's um, he's got sort of a stylized map down here, which I thought was a really interesting interpretation. I think he notes at the bottom that he's, um, uh, it's sort of hard to read, but created GIS information is um, stylized and edited, but originated in ArcGIS. And he's thinking through here with some of the, the themes that we talked about in class. So he's got Americanization, um, the problem of the mega resort, 
um, also walkability. Um, and this is more almost of a, a creative exercise in thinking about what, what we need to notice when looking at, at Macau, um, the Kotai Strip. And um, there's, uh, I think, one more a little lower down that is a bit more um, concrete. Let's see. Oh, Bill, the thing I wanted to show is actually one further down. It's okay. the sliding mechanism. So I, I, yeah, um, the one at the top there with the, yeah, with the yellow and the, there we go. So I encourage my students to ask larger questions about what, what is a map, what constitutes a map, what counts as a map. And this to me was very interesting because he's taken, um, I think some of the, uh, the original plans for the Las Vegas Strip on the left and tried to compare them with what was actually built um, uh, in Macau on the right, thinking about what are the, um, what are the common components of a, of a gaming area? Um, and so this I thought was an unusual interpretation of what, you know, what could constitute a map, but, but very much successful, um, particularly according to the ESRI folks. <laughs> yeah, and then there's one more. Let's see. Um, this one. This one, oh, sorry, Bill, it's a little a little hard to read, but I think oh, oh, this is, density, uh, household size, and then yeah. the other one is PPP per capita. Right, right. So, so here he's looking at the. Um, it's actually a, a similar question to what the the Caribbean map was asking: um, wage gap between service industry and resident and uh, residents of Macau. Um, something that he's um, exploring here with the. There we go. Yeah, showing essentially where where people can afford to live, um, depending on how what their participation in the gaming industry is, um, and so he's collected I think a lot of really interesting data here. It's an ambitious map. This is a longer one, um, but you get an idea of what uh, what students can do if they want to actually take a very um, well, essentially learning to understand scale. And what, um, uh, in this case, how tourism can affect a very small um, part of the world, um, and of course, in the way that wealth travels. So then, there's just one more um, story map. We can move on to the um, the third one. This is an interesting one to me. Um, so orphanage volunteerism in Nepal, um, and a lot of my students are very curious about one of these newfangled terms, volunteerism. So what is the relationship between tourism? We talk about ethical tourism, responsible tourism. Um, what is it to be, of course, in relation to sustainable tourism? And my student here, um, I think her map, it's a little further down, but she's trying to work out um, the relationship between the concentration of certain orphanages in Nepal um, and uh, tourism destinations and thinking through um, to some extent causality. And you know, that is to say, when tourists are looking to visit orphanages as a feature of their, you know, their trip, their experience, um, does, that, does that tend to lead to a clustering of, of orphanages nearby where tourists can easily um, visit? Um, or perhaps there's another way of understanding this, but I think that this was, this is a student who um, leaned pretty heavily on Bill, which was great. <laughs> We, we appreciate the repeat, uh, the higher level of interest. And I want to say, I, this is all done behind the scenes, but that they work together to import a, um, a CSV table or to, to um, put together some data that hadn't, um, hadn't been as readily available. Sometimes there's a bit of a search involved um, when students are, are looking through these um, uh, data sets on, on ArcGIS. Um, yeah, I can just add real quick, sure. Andrea, the, uh, the, the point locations were a CSV or, or table that she compiled that included the latitude and longitude for each one of these, these locations. And so you can bring data like that and add it into ArcGIS online maps very easily. It's a, it's a drag and drop process as long as the table has been formatted properly. And then any information that's in the table, whether it's the name, and I, I'm, I'm not recalling what she had had in here. She's got the name of the national park here. Mm -hmm. um, 
actually that's not the point. The point here is the orphanage is, yeah. or actually, yeah, I think the, the, the point might be the national park here. At any rate, the mm -hmm. information in the table then is, is available in the map to provide symbolization or filtering or labeling, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these were three, I think, pretty successful examples of um, using story maps in this class, uh, which very much, you know, the theme of the class tourism and sustainability lends itself to this kind of work. But honestly, I can't think of, a, of any class that <laughs> couldn't use this technology in some way. Um, so just a, a couple more thoughts um, in terms of what's worked for me in areas where I'm still refining the best way to incorporate this um, pedagogically and in terms of evaluation. I would encourage everybody who wants to try this out to think about and just learn as you go the, the balance of um, uh, different kinds of data, maps, and text in this kind of um, project and when building an argument. So again, um, in a sense, I, well, one way I like to evaluate this is I like to read through them without paying as just mainly focusing on the text and then read through them a second time, mainly focusing on the maps to see if it can be um, I think sometimes it can be very splashy and flashy. And so it's important to be able to identify the core elements of an argument and essentially, are they still citing correctly? Are they still thinking um, creatively? To what extent are they you know, simply relying on the maps to speak for themselves? And that's um, something I think of sort of under the rubric of information literacy, which is something that I know WashU is really working hard to end the, and the, every, all the wonderful people at Olin are working hard to, to emphasize and something I'm trying to incorporate um, in my curriculum. So getting students to think about the re reliability of their sources of their maps. Um, and again, I suppose, um, um, ultimately just circling back to, to me, the most fascinating thing, which is just coming to understand that maps are political projects um, and getting them to try to account for that in their own uh, work and in their own thinking. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was very informative. And so now we're going to go to Sarah Batesel. And Sarah, I've got a window to your final project uh, web app. But I will pause briefly. Actually, let me throw up that slide. Hold on, I'm juggling two screens here and I'm not doing it very efficiently. So I've got a slide here by way of introduction for Sarah. Thank you. Back one. There we go. Uh, yeah, so I have, um, I have a little bit of background working with GIS for my own research um, in archaeology. We do quite a bit of sort of spatial processing, map making, and all of those things. Um, and I think it, it just, I. I teach introduction to archaeology, which means that I have 170 students, of which five want to be archaeologists. Nonetheless, I kind of figured, you know, it's the it's really I get them in the first or second year um, at WashU, and it really for me is sort of the mission to get them exposed to as many different ways of communicating, technologies, all of those things, which in a in a classroom of obviously the size can be incredibly difficult, right? This is a lecture based class. And we have very, very few interactions in any way um, throughout the semester. And so when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, uh, we're going to have to pivot somehow and get these students a little bit more involved. This has been um, much more rewarding for both me and I think the students in the sense that they've been able to um, sort of use this to explore interests that perhaps weren't covered during the course of the semester. Um, the other thing that I think um, it does for students is it shows that they're not working in isolation, right? And I think this is something when you do these compilations of data, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the project in a second, is that um, oftentimes when students prepare anything for class, it ends up being, it ends up on our desk, and it, it sort of is this echo chamber of just producing something for the professor. And I think all of these platforms, and um, I want to thank Andrea and Suzanne for showing their stuff. I think that uh, that's exactly the point, right? You're showing it's making them speak to a wider audience. That's that's not just us um, as the instructor of the course. 
Um, and so the, the point of this, this was the final project for the course. So I, I in a sense, never got the feedback really from the students to um, have a good sense of what they would have liked to change or, or it wasn't particularly interactive, but what, what it was is an online map um, that, that I created a world map and the students were asked to create an artifact to, to think of either choose an artifact, feed archeological feature or site um, from the semester or come up with one of their own. So it was really um, sort of a, a choice um, that they could make and located in space, um, sort of drop a pin on the map, essentially the pin would then be um, coded by whether it was a site, an artifact or a feature. So this is one of the sort of definition, uh, the concept, the definition of concepts that they had to learn throughout the course. So I just used that very lightly. Um, and then they had to put in information about the time period, about the culture, um, a brief description of it. So when you click on any of these um, dots or pins, it gives you about a 200, 500 character. I think Bill and I um, worked on expanding the, the size of the text that could be inserted here. Um, so they have a description, a relevance to the course that they had to discuss, um, a rationale for why they chose this particular feature, and then a link to an image um, from anywhere online. And so this was really low key in the sense. So I didn't want to end the class on a big exam and doing research projects at at an introductory level with a class this size is pretty much impossible. So I kind of, you know, that this was a, this was a great way um, to have them engage with something of their choice outside of the general course format. And I must say, so a lot of the, I think we, in the class, we discussed maybe two North America sites. So the number of pins, especially in North America, I think is testimony to a lot of the students actually looking for archeological sites um, right outside their hometown essentially, or, or in their hometown. Um, and so a lot of them put in their comments that they were really surprised that there was something archaeological um, near their home uh, or somewhere, or perhaps it was uh, a place that they had visited um, somewhere before and that really fascinated them. Or, you know, uh, quite a few of them chose things that we had discussed in class, but that had made such an impression on them that they, um, that what they wanted to delve a little bit deeper into the material. Um, so overall, what I'm hoping to do in the future is not have this be a last minute thing. So not have this stand at the very end of the semester where it then just kind of becomes an output without engagement. And I think um, what would be kind of a fun thing to do is have to start the semester with a platform like this where students put some information up and then can modify it over the course of the semester and perhaps add things that are relevant to the course in some way or draw connections between their own sites and other sites, um, which I would then obviously email Bill and set up a meeting to discuss how we might uh, sort of modify it going, um, going forward uh, throughout the semester. But it really is, you know, and this is sort of something that now exists and can be added to very easily. You can um, uh, sort of delete things or add things. And it generates uh, basically a table in which all of the data becomes populated by the students adding um, through dropping a pin and then filling out the, the information sheet that gets generated at the same time. So it could ostensibly be used throughout the semester to just sort of compile information that is given to students or that students um, research on their own to add to a larger database, which I think um, that might be kind of a, a, a way that it could be integrated as a learning mechanism and not just a, a, sort of a final project in and of itself. Um, let me think a couple of things uh, that I wrote down, but a lot of these have already been addressed. Um, and to be honest, quite frankly, I, I, my, all my thoughts about this course were just washed down by me seeing story maps and scribbling mad notes about how I'm going to use these for my own, for my other course this semester. Um, I think the, the biggest, the advantage here is really the number of students involved. So if it is a large course, then this is a format that gets them away from, gets you away from having a very deep dive into a particular subject and doing a much more sort of potentially collaborative um, work on a larger scale. And I think depending on the level of the course that you're teaching, for me, this is an introductory course. So my point is to get their interest going to sort of have them explore something, but be able to connect it to other students. And I found this platform to be particularly helpful for that purpose. And 
Oh, also this kind of stuff, um, both the story maps and just sort of website building in general, I found really helpful for when I write students' letters of recommendation because I have a product that I can literally put into a letter of recommendation and link mm. the reader to something they've done without them, you know, without sending them a term paper, which would be boring to read. So I just wanted to point out that that's one of the advantages of these products as well. Excellent. Th thanks, Sarah. And, and I just wanted to point out on the example page here, I've just, it, it, there is an edit function. And so users can basically, if they're logged in, can come in and add points of interest. Uh, it's very easy to manage this. Uh, and it is possible to control exactly which users can do this. So um, it, it, it it's not necessarily a, a, a wide open Wild West type situation here where anybody can pour data in, although it can be set up in that manner if you want to allow anyone anywhere to get into the map and add information, that is certainly possible. But with groups, uh, we can control that. And that actually takes me to the next, um, the next uh, section, which is uh, talking about Prof Professor Corinna Tridel. Uh, Dr. Tridel, is the, um, she is a professor in history and also the chair of the history department. And she taught this fall, or I'm sorry, this spring, health and disease in world history. And this was a class that had 70 students approximately. It was uh, basically a, uh, a hybrid format because of the way things were. And she wanted to talk about having a group project where they documented the pandemic experience here at the university. And so the, the idea was that these students would then generate primary source information that would actually be, go, be added to the WashU archive. And that was really the, uh, the motivation behind this. Um, Dr. Tridel actually um, fostered this. Uh, she, we, we integrated it into her class. It was a collaborative effort among several folks here at uh, Olin Library in special collections. And uh, it did culminate in a large collection of uh, story maps re about each one of these aspects. And I'll show you some of those in a second. But they did an article in the um, ampersand about this as well, uh, basically building an, an archive of information about COVID-19 uh, in real time as the students were experiencing it. So there was actually 13 different groups in the course uh, divided up into various topics. And she had uh, defined the topics that she wanted the students to work on. There was a, a list that they might choose from. And then each group was made up of five to six students who then collaboratively built the story maps uh, during the course of the semester. So they were, they were basically required to, as they wanted to talk about, um, identify primary sources for that information. And we were working with Sonia Rooney, who is the university archivist, uh, Miranda Rechtenwald and Cassie Brand are both in um, our special collections department here in the library. Uh, Miranda is the curator of local history and Cassie is the curator of rare books. And, and then I help them technologically as far as getting the students familiar with the story mapping platform and administrating the grouping and things like that. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this show and go to the actual collection. This is uh, a web page that shows a collection of story maps. And this is one of the other functions in ArcGIS Online. You can build story maps, but you can also curate a collection of story maps. And this is the one that was set up for uh, this particular project. So the class itself had, uh, each of the groups had their own um, subgroup in ArcGIS Online, which then allowed them to work collaboratively on a story map that was stored in their group folder. And so, you know, four, four to six folks can actually get in there. They had to time their work appropriately so that they weren't stepping on top of each other, but um, they were able to actually work on the same document uh, 
uh, and and then of course produce that. And I'm just going to at random pick the the first one here, teaching and learning during the pandemic. Uh, this was about how the university adapted to COVID-19 uh, and changed the way teaching was uh, conducted, and uh, some impressions from students about how that worked. So we just have some imagery and some text uh, associated with describing what's going on, but they also the students themselves conducted interviews with teachers uh, to find out exactly how they felt about uh, the, the adjustments that were made uh, to their teaching routine. And then um, they talked about exactly what impact it had on classroom uh, ergonomics and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then they included also some student reflections and interviews. And this kind of highlights the idea. I'm not gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not gonna visit it now, <clears throat> but these these story maps can embed other web pages. You can embed uh, sound or audio uh, files like these, which were audio um, uh, interviews. Uh, you can embed videos. You might have noticed that in some of the other story maps. So there's various types of material that can be poured into these um, into the story map platform uh, to then combine and, and basically build up uh, a, a, an archive of information about what was happening at the university. And the, the library is working now to preserve this uh, for the long term, um, the ArcGIS Online platform is a browser-based or cloud-based platform. So all of the, the material that you see is stored in the cloud on uh, ESRI servers. And um, the university has a site license that allows us to have access to that platform. And I don't foresee that, uh, that access going away, but we are also looking at ways that we can preserve this content uh, outside of that platform uh, uh, in perpetuity. And um, we, we haven't exactly worked that out yet, but this is something that the library is, uh, is certainly taking very seriously. And I'm going to talk now about faculty and student support. There are various um, resources that you have available to you, and it starts with our data services staff. Uh, not only myself, but every other member of the data services team has been using ArcGIS online to some extent uh, over the past several years. And so we have experience with um, helping students understand how to navigate the platform, helping them understand um, best practices for incorporating content, uh, high, finding content to, to build maps from, uh, whether that's uh, data that's already shared through the, um, the platform itself or um, data that they might be compiling in a table or data that they might need to actually digitize uh, on, a, uh, on a base map. All of those formats of data creation are uh, available in the, the, in the uh, ArcGIS online platform. And in many cases, we provide embedded workshops. So class, classes that want to incorporate story maps, for instance, we usually plan early in the semester or at the time that the project will be beginning uh, a visit to the to the classroom where we can actually um, walk the students through a, a hands-on workshop either in the classroom where students are working on their own laptops or or excuse me through a um, a session in our computer teaching lab now, for the fall, the teaching labs are not going to be available, but if, uh, if faculty members wanted to arrange that in the future, that is certainly going to be a possibility. So a, a class would come in, uh, we would have them sit at the computers, and we can guide them through the process of creating uh, a, a story map or building an actual online map. We also have a help desk that is manned throughout the course of the semester, Monday through Thursday. Uh, there's a couple of hours every day that somebody is going to be on site in Olden Library, um, at, either in our offices or in the research studio on level A, where students can basically walk in and get some assistance. And so they would be able to get, get help there. And of course, faculty members are, are uh, perfectly uh, 
will are perfectly able to join those sessions as well, or we can set up one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations with faculty uh, if you're interested in thinking about including this. There are lots of online resources, and one of those that I want to point out is our research guide. So let me end this show here for a second. And the research guide, and I'm going to put this link into the chat. This is our GIS research guide. It's in the, uh, the library's webpage. It includes information about GIS in general at the university and how we can support many of the spatial mapping or spatial analysis uh, aspects of teaching and learning and research. Uh, the thing I want to point out here is the software installation guide. Uh, and it, it includes a link to ArcGIS Online, which basically walks anyone, any member of the WashU community who ha happens to have a Wustel ID, it walks you through the process of, of getting into ArcGIS Online and, and basically activating your account. This is a process that, that happens automatically. Uh, there's no real interaction with anyone required. You could tell your students, you could give them the link to this page and say, hey, I want everybody to, to get into uh, ArcGIS Online, uh, and and you know, ten minutes later, they're all uh, in and able to work on it. And during my demo session, I'll show you a little bit about how uh, that would work. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk uh, or briefly mention, ESRI has a lot of online resources. They have videos that walk uh, walk people through uh, a lot of the types of information that they would need. Uh, on my uh, story map page, I've got some collections set up that are available for faculty to use. And one of them is learning to story map. So this is a collection of story maps that teach you how to to do story maps. So it's kind of a self, uh, self perpetuating cycle here. Um, but there's th this one nine steps to great storytelling, basically, not only presents the nuts and bolts of how you pour information into a story map, but also how do you plan it? How do you, you know, get started? Um, what exactly are good best practices for uh, creating a story map? And, you know, it basically starts with a bang. You want to pick a, pick a good uh, image to start off with. And, um, you know, you can start off even with a video as, as this example uh, demonstrates. So there are lots of ways that, that you can, or that we can support student and faculty usage of this particular platform. So I am, uh, I'm gonna skip the break session that was planned for right now. And we're gonna go right into a demonstration. And the demonstration that I'm going to do is not so much trying to teach you how to do this, but I just wanted to show you briefly uh, the steps that someone would go through uh, to make a simple map uh, and basically how, you, how a student would get started. So um, currently I'm logged in to ArcGIS Online and actually I'm going to, sign out and show you what that login process looks like. Through the web page, the students would actually access this Washington University portal, and then it would prompt them for their Wustel key information. Uh, I actually have a separate account, so I'm not going to use this to, uh, to log in, so I'll back up. But the process basically requires them to, to insert their Wustel key information in that uh, in the Wustel key box. And then it brings them into the um, ArcGIS Online homepage. And every homepage is going to look the same. Uh, the information here in the gallery is a set of uh, story maps or applications or map web maps uh, that I've chosen to highlight for whatever reason. Uh, and students can, uh, our faculty can actually link to these uh, and, and uh, find out exactly what they can do with them. We have other um, resources up here along the top. Uh, the gallery shows other, other sites. Um, the map page is the one where we're going to start. And this basically allows uh, a user to go in and begin the map creation process. So the the map page itself includes step-by-step -step instructions over here on the left-hand side on how someone would create uh, a simple map. And it starts with adding data. And so the add data button includes several different resources where you might be able to find data. Uh, I'm gonna search for some layers and there are several 
places where I can find layers, either in my own content or things that I've marked as favorites, I'm going to use today the Living Atlas. The Living Atlas is a set of uh, authoritative resources that is curated by ESRI and made available to the ArcGIS online community. And it includes a lot of very interesting data sets. And let's see, Andrea, I believe you mentioned wildfires uh, earlier in your, your talk. That was uh, serendipitously one of the examples that I wanted to show today. So I, under Living Atlas, I'm gonna search on wildfire and um, that's gonna return everything that the Living Atlas contains pertaining to wildfires uh, in, a, in a usable fashion. And you can see there's a fairly long list of items here. Uh, the one I want is right here at the top. It's called USA Wild, Current Wildfires. It's a, a, a web page that's curated by Esri and it was last updated on August 4th. So this is a very current set of information. If you if the user clicks on the icon, it pulls up some information about the um, layer itself. Uh, it shows you that it's authoritative and it's in the living atlas. That's just a, a process that Esri uses to identify that the, the, the data comes from a source who is uh, recognized as, a, as an authoritative source. The description tells you uh, this is sourced from the integrated reporting of wildland fire information and the natural national interagency fire Center. So these are um, government agencies that are designed to track such things. And so we can actually as assume that this is going to be an authoritative layer that we might want to include on our map. I'm not going to read the rest of the information here, but it tells how often it's updated. It tells what types of functions can be done with this layer. And then it talks a little bit about the attribute information that's also included in the, in the layer itself. I'm going to go ahead and add this to my map. And we'll pause for dramatic effect. I'll get this not responding message for long. I, I have a contingency plan if, if necessary, but uh, the, uh, the, the this is the uh, the standard demo uh, bugaboo that happens when you're trying to do something live. I'm going to try that one more time. And if it doesn't work, I've got some slides to back me up. Happens to the best of us, Bill. It does. You know, it worked fine 20 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Famous last you know, word, Bill, right? Um, this, this is probably a good opportunity to say that some of the um, data in the Living Atlas is not necessarily a file that you download and put on your machine. It's actually a web service that is constantly um, kind of sending messages to a web server out there and saying, hey, give me this information and put it in my map. So you you're really have a live link to the information when you pull it in from, from, um, uh, from Living Atlas, uh, as opposed to to downloading data that you might save on your computer. So maybe this is a good way of um, illustrating that. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good point. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up some slides because I, I, I was worried that something like this might happen. And so I did prepare for that. <clears throat> Now, Molly's point about that is, is exactly correct. These are dynamic layers that are shared and updated continuously in some cases. And um, it's a two-edged sword. You know, you get the issue where we might have access issues, but you also don't have to deal with the, um, the, the practice of managing that data on your own. So you don't have to download the data, make sure you keep track of it. And keep it up to date. In this case, they, they update it automatically. And so that's kind of something that we don't necessarily need to worry about. But um, the points that I wanted to make, I wanted to uh, cover myself here. And so I, I have some slides prepared that will kind of guide you through the process that I'm working in. Um, this was basically for accessing the ArcGIS online and logging in. Uh, that's a relatively simple process. It gets us to our homepage. And then we can begin creating 
maps. And and one point I do want to point want to make: there are actually two versions of the map viewer in ArcGIS Online. Um, new users will probably be seeing this map viewer class, or I'm sorry, will be seeing the new map viewer, which is the one on the right. Um, those of us who are old school might be using the classic map viewer that's here on the left. <clears throat> there are some substantial differences between the functionality of those. If you decide that you want to, to work in this platform, it would be good to, for us to discuss exactly uh, why, why and how they differ and, and where one might be advan advantageous over the other. Uh, but what I wanted to illustrate with this uh, process here is the idea of creating maps using this living atlas data. So the U.S. current wildfires is a set of point features that show the locations of wildfires, along with in this upper image, you can see a polygon feature, and that's actually the outline of where the fire has currently burnt. And so it's basically dynamically over time getting built up with new fires uh, and the extent of those fires are changing. Another layer that I wanted to point out was some American Community Survey census data. The Census Bureau obviously gives us our, our decentennial uh, census data every 10 years, uh, but every year they do the American Community Survey, which gives us a statistical look at the United States and provides information that, that is very, um, uh, it's broad and it includes a lot of demographic information that students might find uh, extremely useful. And in the image here, I've added a layer. Um, it's kind of obscured. The fire layer is underneath. You can see the some of the points on the outskirts of this uh, other layer, which indicates and highlights the idea that these layer, these these data sit on top of each other. And in this case, the um, the default presentation of the population data is a filled polygon that symbolized based on the, the number of population in that particular state. If we're zooming into the to the uh, to the map, it's a dynamic situation where the closer you zoom, the more detail is revealed. Very much like Google Earth, when you zoom in, you begin to see state boundaries and then county boundaries and then um, cities and towns and things like that. So there is a dynamic scale associated with ArcGIS Online, and with this particular population. Uh, set of variables as well. And so when we zoom into that, uh, we begin to see more and more detail. We, we can control the symbology and the layering of these different uh, features. And in this map down here on the lower left, I've actually turned off the population data and moved it below the fire incidents. And, and I've so we can actually get a better look at these wildfire incidents and a pop-up that is automatically configured to operate with these features. So users can go in, click on the feature. It brings up this attribute information about that particular bootleg incident fire, uh, when it was uh, discovered, how many acres it's burned, and how, what percentage of containment. And then it's current as of, in this case, when I made the image, August 3rd uh, at 9.05 PM. So this was the last time that that particular information was was updated before I made this screen capture. So the, um, the layers themselves can be controlled as far as the order of the layer in the map. Uh, the symbology of the layer in this case comes along with that living atlas data set, but in many cases the user will be able to control that, um, changing the symbology, um, changing the, the color, the size of the symbols, things like that. We can also filter the layer. And in fact, the layer that's visible here has been filtered for residences impacted uh, greater than five. So the data set also captures the number of residences that have been burned by that particular fire. And so instead of showing all of the incidences that are in the data set, I wanted to focus on only those that have impacted five or more residences. And so I applied a filter to the layer, and that's one of the functions that we can do. And basically, I've identified that those are the only ones I want to visualize in my map. 
Now, beyond that, I can zoom in on particular fires and create bookmarks. Uh, these are bookmarks, spatial bookmarks, just like you would make a bookmark in a web page where it will return you to that location automatically. And so I set up several bookmarks in my map for uh, the Dixie incident, the Muddy Slide, and the Robertson Draw fires. And when I um, access my live map, I'm able to utilize those bookmarks to draw attention to those specific fires uh, and help my users understand what's going on there. Now, the map here at the lower right shows a, um, an incident where I've activated the population boundaries again. And uh, it was, may not have been clear when I brought that population in, uh, population data layer in, I actually get three layers from that. One layer is at the state level, one is at the county level and one is at here, which is the tract level. Uh, and this is a fairly small area that includes demographic information that might be of use here. Now, one of the things that I was interested in was finding out what the population is that might have been impacted by this particular fire. So the population or the, the fire boundary is defined here as a polygon layer. And then around it are the purple um, polygons representing the census tracts. And each of those census tracts has a population value associated with it. And so I can utilize this fire polygon and something called uh, spatial analysis to um, look at this as, uh, look at this uh, fire in a little bit more detail. As, as I said, I'm interested in knowing the number of population that are impacted. So I can use this, this polygon to select the census tracts in which for which it intersects. And then I can just sum the population in those census tracts to determine that there's about 20 or 30,000 people in these uh, areas that are impacted by that particular fire. Now that's a very uh, basic way of looking at this question. And um, with analysis though, I can take it a little bit further. So, um, there is a data enrichment function in ArcGIS Online that allows me to utilize this polygon and a, a process called apportioning to understand and apply the numbers of population for each one of these census tracts according to the amount of the census tract that it's overlapping that particular polygon. So if the, if the census tract is half in the fire area and half without, I can make an assumption that if the population is evenly distributed across for the number that's associated with the tract would be impacted by the fire. Uh, directly. Uh, of course, you know, obviously smoke and, and, and inconvenience would be uh, a factor with uh, neighbors, but uh, it allows me to calculate this value and associate that with the polygon. In that case, I, I come back with a, a value around 227. So it's a, it's a much smaller number, but it's based on this spatial analysis. And, and this is a, um, a function of ArcGIS Online that basically takes it beyond just the storytelling aspect into a data analysis aspect as well. Uh, and so that is something that is, is possible with the platform uh, and something that, that students might think about uh, as they begin to understand what they can do with this. Now, during the process of map creation, you basically build an object that is stored in the line account. And in just a moment, I'll, I'll get out of the slideshow and go back to my, to my map to hopefully show you what that looks like live. But I can take the maps that I've created in ArcGIS Online and then use the story mapping function to build an actual story map based on that information. Uh, and that's basically what this uh, slide is all about. Uh, I, and I'll show you that uh, live here in just a second, but I just wanted to move to the final slide on this aspect of it, which is preview, sharing content or publishing. Uh, with content, whether it's a map or a story map, all of it has to, all of it initially begins in a private state. And so it's part of my account. Uh, the only person that can see it is me and anyone who has admin privileges uh, to the ArcGIS Online organization. 
I can actually share that information with my organization as a whole or with members of specific subgroups. So for instance, in Corinna Tridel's case, we set up groups for each one of her projects. And so they were able to share content into those editable groups that allowed everyone in the group to share and edit the same, the same material. I can also share this publicly. So I can just say, you know what, anybody who wants to have a look at this can look at it. I could then share that URL with, you know, research partners from other universities, uh, mom and dad back at home. Uh, those, those things are all possible with uh, when, the, uh, when the product is shared publicly. So I'm going to stop this show for just a second. And let's see if this is gonna work. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my story maps. And I, I, I adopted the Food Network school of uh, make sure you've got something in the oven um, <laughs> to show. So I'm gonna pull out my quiche and I think it's done. Um, here's my, here's my web, or I'm sorry, here's my story map that I created and I'm going to activate the edit story option here uh, to see if I can actually show you uh, some of the behind the scenes activities here. So with a story map like this, um, basically you're pouring content into a template. Uh, there is a, a setup here at the beginning that allows me to include an image. In this case, I could replace that image, in, in which case it allows me to browse for image files that are stored on my computer. So I'm gonna do that. And I've happened to have that Spokane wildfires image on my local computer. I'm gonna use that and basically put it up there back again. And so it allows me to uh, perform that function. I can also control the focal point. Right now it's, it's not showing what I'd like to see, which is some of this dramatic um, view of where there's a house in danger here. Uh, I'd like to make sure that's included. So I adjusted the focal point of the image to make that happen. And right now I'm, I'm actually using about half of my so-called home page or entry page uh, for my image, but I can also format this under the design function to allow me to let that image take up a full page. Uh, so there are lots of uh, options here in the design panel that allow students to have a bit of uh, flexibility and creativity along with the, the design for their particular web page. Now, I've made some changes to my page, and you might have noticed up here at the top, it says saved. And let me make this bigger in case you guys can't see that well. Uh, at the top of the page, it said saved. Uh, and, and it indicates that this ArcGIS online platform is automatically saving this product. Uh, that's not necessarily true about the maps that I create. And when I'm building maps, I need to save those as I work along. But in this case, it's, it's, saving, that I, it's saving that material uh, automatically. Now, in this completed version, I've already added content, but adding content is a very simple process. Um, in the, at the plus sign, you can, uh, you can incorporate various other content, whether it's text, uh, a button that you might create to initiate an activity or log in or um, open up a new web page, or you can um, include other media like images, videos, audios, and so forth. Uh, there are several immersive sections that you can include in the map, and I'm going to demonstrate one below called a sidecar. Um, but there are, you know, these are the types of content that students would be able to pour into the map. And in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each one of those. But here I've got an example of a web page that I embedded. And then this is one of those maps that I created showing the the fire locations. And as I said, there's a pop-up associated with it where a user can, pop, can click on the object uh, and open it up. The user could also uh, expand this map and pan and zoom around so that they can focus in on an area that's of interest to them. And so this is all dynamically associated with that page. Uh, down below it, this is now getting into one of those immersive sections. And as I scroll up, it gets to the point where the image locks 
and the text on the left hand side scrolls. And as I scroll through one of the slides in the in the sidecar, I get to the point where I'm done with my text and I move on to a new uh, and, and this one shows the population associated with that area. And if I continue to scroll, I'll move into a third slide, which focuses on, in on a different fire at a different location. All of those are accessing the exact same map. And so I've only had to create one map, but I'm able to include several different views of that map in my story map. And then, of course, on the panel side, I can include text and images. And, um, and so students are able to actually build uh, qu quite an extensive uh, presentation uh, in this particular platform. Uh, so this is actually the edit mode, but I'm going to return back to the top and uh, get out of my full screen mode here so I get my full menu. And I'm going to look at the preview option. The preview option lets you look at the page as it would be seen by another user, and you'll know the various platforms that I can preview this for, such as a, a cell phone or a tablet. And it changes the way the output looks, and it gives the students a very good way to evaluate what it's going to look like when different types of uh, devices are used to access their material. And, and that, may, that may guide their decisions about how things uh, appear, but the maps are still dynamic. They still have the pop-ups associated with them, and they still have that dynamic pan and zoom option. So I'm gonna close the preview mode. And then the final thing I wanna talk about briefly before I open it up for Q&A is this publishing idea. And so the publishing basically is where the user sets that sharing. And right now I've got this set up to share with my organization. So anybody who's in uh, the WashU organization can see this. I'm gonna change this now so that it's shared publicly and publish the story. And the platform actually checks to see if there are some issues. And it, it's found that some of my maps don't have the same sharing setting that my story map does, but it's going to automatically take care of that for me. So I'm going to share those items as well, and it's going to publish this story. And then I'm going to put a link to the story in the, um, in the chat so you guys can have a look at it uh, on your systems if you like. And with that, I think that um, I think that actually I have one more slide to share based on resources. So let me go there and then we'll go to Q&A. So for resources, there's a lot of links and as I said, I'm gonna share this set of slides with all of you so that you'll have these links um, for your use uh, after, the, after the fact. But there's a learning the story map collection of stories. That's the, that's the one I showed you that I've compiled. Uh, Data Services has a set of ArcGIS online tutorials. Some of these are videos that basically guide students through uh, very basic ArcGIS online processes. ArcGIS online itself has a home page and a resource page. And there's this Teach with Story Maps portal, which is um, a resource from the University of Michigan, or, I'm sorry, the University of Minnesota. And I'm gonna open up that page. And this page actually includes a lot of resources that faculty members might be interested in, including instructional resources, such as uh, sample um, assignment types, um, rubric templates, and basically examples of the story mapping has been included in various types of courses. And so you might find this of interest and I'll share this link in the, um, in the chat as well. Thanks to the faculty for joining us. I really appreciate your, uh, your input. It's a, it's a pleasure working with you guys and uh, I'm really glad that it's turned into uh, you know, a positive situation for all of us. Bye everybody.